Lord. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this evening, I want to tarry just a little bit here, so forgive me. Take a little bit of, just a little extra time. Uh, we, we were getting prepared for uh, going out of town. We we're getting ready to leave and go to North Carolina for youth camp, and we've got all kinds of things going on, and I'll be leaving first thing in the morning, so we've spent a lot of time packing and, you know, all everything you can imagine. And so my wife, she has really worked hard to make sure everything is just right, and she's turned my printer off three times already, and we haven't even left yet. And uh, she just likes to take care of things. I got the best wife a man could ever ask for. And uh, I told the bishop last night he laid it so thick, I would have to lay in sackcloth and ashes for a whole day and till tonight just to be able to preach. But I did do a lot of seeking of the Lord today and praying and uh, studying the Word of God. And uh, this evening, I hit print on that printer, and that printer was turned off. And so I reached over and turned it on. I didn't realize the printer tray wasn't out. So I got page number one and page number three. So I told you I was going to tarry a little bit. Thank God my wife's, uh, hopefully, she, you pray she don't get a ticket. She'll be right back with the other page. But you know what? Even if not, you know, I'm thankful tonight to be able to be here. Uh, I want to share something with you. And uh, if I leave you standing too long, forgive me. Uh, you can be thankful we're not in the Old Testament where they stood for six hours and read the Word of God. That'd be rough, wouldn't it? Praise the Lord. But the Lord had laid something on my heart today, and I wanted to share it with you. I spoke this into my spirit. And uh, he said, when we fail to experience times of refreshing is when what we do becomes a ritual and not a reason. Think about it for just a minute. When we fail to experience times of refreshing is because what we have done and what we are doing is becoming a ritual and not a reason. We can go through all of the motions of singing and worshiping and everything else and not really do what we're supposed to because of the right reason. I can tell you that as a pastor, preacher, I've been in a lot of churches and a lot of places, and I've seen people worship for the wrong reason. People get, a, they get used to and accustomed to the way that things go, and there's been times before. I remember a few years ago we were getting started, and the service was just going through the ritual. And it was dry. Everybody was doing what they normally do. But I stopped, and I said, I want everybody to stop right now. And I want you to go outside, come back in, sit somewhere different. We're going to start all over. We were about halfway or more than halfway through the service. Everybody thought I'd lost my mind. But I said, I refuse to let one service go by and not have church. I've been saying it for a long time. You've probably heard it yourself. But I was born in the fire and the smoke just won't do. That's the way I feel tonight. I didn't go through all the time and everything getting ready for church to just come in and, you know, oh, let's get through this and let's go home. You see, when you really fall in love with God, this is your life right here. This is everything to you. You're not worried about what's on the news right now. You're not worried about who's winning the, the game right now. You're not worried about what's going on outside of church. This is everything to you. I want you to know tonight I've got a reason, and I'm glad you got a reason tonight. I feel like God wants to speak to us. So let's just see what the Lord's got in store for us. I've really sought the Lord from a sincere heart about this service, and I pray that He'll talk to you. And before you leave, that God will say something to change the atmosphere of what's going on in your life right now. Turn with me in your Bibles tonight to Judges chapter 15. We're going to start with verse 14. We're going to read through to verse number 19, a familiar story in the Word of God. Judges chapter 15, verses 14 through 19 tonight.
Judges 15, verses 14 through verse number 19. Praise the Lord. Do continually covet your prayers tonight. God would just use me to say what he wants to say, and then I can just move right out of the way. Let him do what he wants to do tonight. How many wants the Lord to change things in their life tonight? I don't want to talk a lot here, but I do want you to know this. As I sought the Lord, the one thing that has continually come to my mind today as I studied and prayed and sought the Lord with tears is I don't want to preach to people just to say I preached. I want to be able somehow to say something under the anointing and inspiration of the Holy Ghost that will do something that you'll be thinking about it a week from now. I don't want to just fill space and time. Do you? Will you just take a moment before we read this text and just slip your hand up and just say to the Lord, Tonight, God, I want you to change the climate of who I am. Judges chapter 15. I just feel like preaching tonight. 14 through verse number 19. The Bible said, and when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire and his bands loosed from off his hands. And he found a new jawbone of a donkey and put it forth, put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of this donkey have I slain a thousand men. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking, that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place Rameth Lehi. Can I say this to you tonight before we read on? Be careful to cast away the thing that gave you victory already. Something that has already brought you victory and you're going to throw it to the side. Be careful. So Samson, the Bible tells us about him throwing this jawbone to the side in verse 18. He was sore athirst and called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and into the and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. But God clave and hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water there out, and when he had drunk, his spirit came again. I want you to really pay close attention to this verse. But God clave an hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water there out, and when he had drunk, His spirit came again, and he revived. Wherefore, he called the name thereof Enhak Or, which is in Lehi unto this day. If you will, stretch your hands to the Lord tonight. Let's begin to pray for God's will and his anointing on the word of God. Lord. We thank you for this great privilege to preach the word of God. We ask you tonight, God, that you will add that anointing season my lips, Lord, as a burning fire, God, to speak the word with boldness. Lord, I pray that you'll talk to this congregation. Lord, that they would hear what they need to hear. That, Lord, things will begin to change in their life. Lord, we're here tonight representing a time of refreshing. Now, Lord, we pray that you will refresh the saints of God. Lord, if there be somebody tonight that needs to be saved, we pray, God, save them to the uttermost. Sanctify and baptize with the Holy Ghost. And we'll praise you for what you do in this place tonight. And all of God's people can say, Amen. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord.
I do want to tell you tonight how much I am honored to be here. I thank God for the privilege to be able to preach the word. And I realize, as the man of God said last night, Bishop said that he knows a lot of preachers. I can't imagine him growing up in the church like he did. I wish I could have had that same experience. But he knows a lot of men, so I count it a great honor to be able to stand before you tonight and preach the word of God. There are two other places in the scripture that I'd like for us to take a look at. You don't have to turn there, but I'll just call it a subtext tonight. But speaking of the Egyptian that David's men found in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse number 11, it said, And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat. They made him drink water and they gave him a piece of a cake, two figs, two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, the Bible said, his spirit came again to him for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights now you see this word this phrase came again it represents something in the Hebrew that I want you to listen to tonight because the same inference that we find here about this Egyptian man is the same inference that we read about with this Samson with a jawbone and he is revived and he his spirit comes to him again and so we read it here but this is what that it means in the Hebrew it is the word shub which means to bring back come back recover, restore, retrieve, or refresh. Now you see when I read this, I didn't understand why the Lord was taking me here because a few days ago as I began to pray and seek the Lord and God began to deal with my spirit like he was, I began to pray and say, God, what do you want me to preach? How do you want me to preach this? I'd like to stay along the theme of this unity conference about refreshing, a time of refreshing. So God, how am I going to do this? And the Lord began to speak to me. And this is what he said. His spirit came again. I didn't know what that was. I knew it was somewhere in the Bible. Didn't remember where it was. So I began to do some research. And I came to this portion of scripture about Samson with this jawbone. And one thing led to another. And I never would have thought that this original Hebrew word shub would simply mean to retrieve to recover and to refresh you see God wants to be able to let your spirit and my spirit come again you see for us to understand tonight what this means it's not the only inference in the word of God if we turn over to the New Testament we read about a, a man by the name of Jairus he had a little 12 year old daughter who was laying sick at the point of death you know the story they came to him and said don't trouble the master anymore because uh, this little girl she's dead no reason to bother but Jesus comes anyway and when he gets there in Luke chapter 8 and verse 54 and 55 this is what it said and he put them all out took her by the hand and called saying maid arise and her spirit came again and she arose straightway and commanded to give her meat you see that word original in the Greek is epistropho which means to revert or to return again so with the Lord's help tonight I'd like to preach when my spirit returns when my spirit returns you see I've already got notice from heaven that there are some people that would be here tonight that are in a place in their life that they can recall a time when the Holy Ghost would breathe through them and they would feel that heavenly hope they would feel that anointing that would destroy the yoke of bondage they remember the times that God would use them to sing the times that God would use them to stand up and testify
testify and tear the house down. Come on, somebody. They remember those times and they're tired of not feeling that in their life. They'll get up and they go through the motions and they try to cheerlead. Come on, church. Get in with me, church. Come on, church. Raise your hands, church. Somebody praise him, church. Somebody lift your hand, church. Somebody clap your hands, church. And all of this. And uh, you think to yourself, I shouldn't have to cheerlead nobody. There ought to be something welling up on the inside of me that changes the atmosphere. You see, what God wants to do is for your spirit to come back to you. That place in your life where things make a difference. When you speak, it's as if the Lord himself is speaking through you. Hallelujah. If you don't mind, I'll just take my time. It's okay. Amen. I remember just as a small child, my mom began to teach me how to cook. She wanted me to show me how to do some cooking, you know. Oh, I love my mom. I was a mama's boy. That's all right. I got there in the kitchen, and mom started showing me how to cook. Well, I remember one time that I put something on the stove, and uh, I was real bad about wanting To me, more is always better, you know. Come on, somebody. Amen. To, uh, more is better. So I, I reached up, and I had a bad habit of trying to cook everything on high. Uh, and so uh, I put something on the stove uh, I don't remember what it was uh, with some broken pole it's probably Roman noodles uh, amen but I turned around uh, I went to the other room uh, and when I came back into the room uh, guess what was happening uh, it looked like a foam uh, volcano uh, there was stuff boiling out of the top of the pot uh, it was going all down into the into the burner and I didn't know what to think uh, you see the the reason that that is is because something on the inside of that pot got so hot that it had to go some something on the inside of that pot got so hot that it had to go somewhere are you hearing what I'm saying there was something that got so hot it had to go listen when your spirit comes back to you there's going to be something inside the pot that's going to get so hot it's got to go somewhere Come on, somebody, say amen. You see, what you've been waiting on is right there. Amen. What you need is for it to get hot enough. Woo! Somebody shout praise the Lord. Come on, lift your hands. I feel the spirit of the Lord. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I hope I can get through this tonight. Hallelujah. You see, it's already been mentioned in the last night or two. Amen. About the refreshing and what we call the times of refreshing. You see, these times are they're not just a continuation, but could be best compared to seasons. Now, I want you to understand why that I say that tonight. It's simply because if it was a time of refreshing and it was a continual 24-7, then what do you need refreshing from? Why do you need to be unraveled if you've never been raveled? Why do you need to be fixed if you've never been broke? You see, you may think, well, every time we come to church, we ought to pull the chandeliers down. We ought to sing, swing from the ceiling fans and kick our heels and have church. Listen, I love to have church. But let me 
tell you this, church. You see, sometimes you got to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes you got to walk through some of the quagmires of trials and error and problems. But my God, what I want you to understand is that God has a time of refreshing. Send it on down. Send it on down. Lord, let the... Come on down. As much as some folks say they'll get somebody saved and the first thing they'll do is they'll make it sound like it's always going to be just like this right here. And then the first time they pray about a bad situation and it don't go so well, they fall out of church. Amen. So instead of feeding somebody a false hope that it's always going to be roses and you're always going to be on the mountaintop, here's what you tell somebody. Son or daughter, the times of refreshing are going to make the valley worthwhile. Amen. The times of refreshing are going to make you look back and appreciate every good thing God did. Can I make it real? All right. I'm going to step away. Pray for me. All those services where you struggle. Come here. Turn around. All those services where you push and you're trying to have church and you're fighting and you're struggling and you're doing everything well if we sing that one song that'll definitely get them cranked up if we say the right thing that'll definitely get them shouting come on they'll definitely pray amen come on somebody you may think I've lost my mind but I've been around this too long for you to tell me any otherwise and you're doing everything you can and when it's over with sometimes if you're the one that's leading the choir leading the praise team leading the worship you'll go home thinking I must not have had it tonight I must have failed somehow I must have missed it somehow but let me tell you saints of God you come in with a spirit that has come again you will create an atmosphere where the devil cannot trod I have been in church atmospheres. Come on now. Where I got up and the Holy Ghost used me, touched me, moved through me, and anointed me. But if you'd have looked at that church, you'd have thought I had lost it. I have been other atmospheres where the Holy Ghost was so real and the people were so hungry. You could say biscuits and gravy and they'd shout with you. Come on now. Amen. Come on now, preacher. Bring it on. You're making us hungry. Biscuits and gravy got us thinking about the Lord because they're just desperate and their spirit has come again. Here's what I'm telling you tonight. It's a difference of something's down inside of you. Come on, pastor. Pastor preacher, don't blame yourself, man of God. There's something wrong inside, and that's why they kick against you. I read a story one time, and it said like this. Amen. It's a Guinness Book World Record. A man with big, strong muscles. He was not me. He tied a bunch of ropes. His legs and his arms. He was aiming to impress somebody. We have too much of that already. Come on, somebody. Whatever comes from your heart will reach a heart. Whatever comes from your mind. He got out there on the runway. And they strapped him to a 747. Come on now. That's a big airplane. Well, he's a pretty big man, but he looked like an ant standing by that airplane. <laughs> Come here, brother. I use you again. 
you're going to be my man strapped to the airplane, okay? I ain't never going to get through this message. Hallelujah. Turn around. You know, the other way. All right. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to do like you, that man, and you're just pulling a 747. You're struggling. Come on, pull it. Come on. He's pulling. Go ahead. You can make a stride. Amen. Everything he can just to make a little bit of motion. And guess what? When it was all said and done, amen, the record said he pulled that 747 X amount of 100 feet down the runway. Good to hear him, right? That's the dumbest thing I've read in a long time. A 747, folks. Got big jet engines on the side of it. And a man going to pull it down the runway. Do you know how foolish we look sometimes in church when we're trying to get some work done? It's because we hadn't really prayed or fasted or, or got a hold of God and let our spirit come again. How foolish we look when we're trying to pull a 747 down the runway when God said, if you let the Holy Ghost, I got a jet engines that'll get this service off the ground. You see, when we start trusting in God and we say, God, if you don't do it, it ain't going to be done. That's when we're going to know we're having an old time church. When my spirit returns, when it comes back, when, I, when it comes back to me, you know, what I find interesting is the fact that I know what this feels like. You ever looked at somebody having troubles, you know, maybe something wrong with their leg or the knee, or, and you can, you, you know what they're feeling. I feel this way down here. About three weeks ago, I came into church and uh, I was feeling, you know, uh, just a burden. I was feeling just the weight of ministry and the weight of problems. And we just, uh, you know, we hadn't long gone through a lot of stuff. And all of that, you know, and all of that on my shoulders. Uh, and knowing I got to go to the pulpit and preach. And I'm thinking, Lord, you know, I'm trying to get my mind on the message. Uh, but every time I catch myself thinking about something else, uh, and, I, and, and I'm real funny because I don't want to take away uh, from the people because I say God I work for you and I don't want to disappoint God but I came in that morning we got to sing and we got to worship and amen magnifying God and I just come off the platform and I raised my hands and I began to worship I began to glorify God and I said Lord I need you I magnify you, God, I need a touch. You know what happened, church? All of a sudden, about 85 or 90% of my church, they came and they gathered around and they put their arms around me. I could hear them squalling like babies. God, touch our pastor. God, touch a man of God. God, give him strength. God, renew him. Do you know some church, when I tried to get at home by myself and I felt like I couldn't get a breakthrough that morning right standing over there God gave this preacher amen a breakthrough you know what happened to me my spirit came again I'm going to tell you the truth I have preached without it I'm not saying I was lost. I ain't saying I was in sin. But I have preached when my spirit wasn't there. I have preached. Amen. I have got up and I have sang when my spirit was not there. And there are times, thank God for our memory. Come on. There are times in my mind that all I can think about is another time whenever I sang and I can feel the burning hot heat of the anointing all over me. You see, if we ever get so far away as to forget what God had did with the jawbone, we'll never pick it up and ever drink what God gave us. So 
somebody shout, Lord, give it to us tonight. You see, the problem is, is that we become overloaded. This is for you. Listen closely. We become overloaded. We become burdened down. We become so perplexed. You're trying to find a song to sing for the service. And you're wondering why your husband didn't come. And that's all you can think about. Come on somebody. You're going to put your tithe in the offering. And you're thinking God I hope you come through. Because this is all I've got. And you can't have faith like you used to have. Something has happened to you. And I tell you what you did. You threw away that old landmark. That said by faith. There was a time that I trusted God. There was a time that I'd have believed God for anything. Now I can have my own pastor lay his hands on me and I walk away and wonder to myself, is it going to happen? Oh, come on now. I've watched people that just got saved. They get saved. They got that new faith. Come on. They got that fresh faith. They still believe the man of God's the man of God. Hey, come on now. They, they, so they look at the man of God like he really is. And when the man of God lays hands on them and prays, they really believe it. And they really get a touch. But then they get around all the other negative, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know what? I, I, I heard ties is down. I heard, I, I don't know. I don't want to go to church with y'all. I heard our drum player might be leaving. Come on. I heard sister so and so may not come back. And that means I got to do everything now. I, I hope they understand. I just hope they understand what they're doing to me. I just, oh, in some ways you better be careful because you just about wish bad on somebody. And slowly, like a pot with a crack, your spirit is leaving. <laughs> that fire, that effectiveness that you once had is slowly leaking out of the vessel. Come on, let me preach to you tonight. I'm going to preach to you like a pastor. Is that okay? I have preached before, been in church, and you have people arguing up on the platform. Making funny faces at each other. And then turn around. Worship him. And everybody sitting in the church is looking at you going, go on with it. You done killed it for me. All I can think about while I'm trying to see how great is our God is how big your frown was. All I can see is that big old hateful look on your face and I ain't in the mood to worship with you because you got a bad spirit. And I tell you something tonight, church, what we need is a revival of people in the church house with their spirit coming again. Because when... I didn't plan on preaching like this. And I ain't never going to get done. We got people sitting in the church that ain't going to get with sister. What's her name? I was mad at her. I'm not going to get with her because I'm mad at her. And then your turn to be next. Come on, everybody. Why ain't y'all worshiping? Yeah, preach. You want to know what turns me off more than anything? Well, it's right at the top. It's hypocrite on God. I've never seen the lights. You get people, come on, worship with me. Come on, worship with me. And then when everybody's up, they're clipping their fingernails, playing on the iPhone and everything else. 
Come on, y'all gonna shout with me a little. When your spirit comes back to you, you're gonna put all that foolishness aside. If you, come on, you will go to somebody, even if you wasn't the one that started it, and say, let's make amends. Let's put, let's bury the axe. Because I can't have church, and you can't have church until we put this devil upon our feet. I believe it was, amen, Reverend Kenny Morris that said it like this. He said, we got an epidemic in the church. He's a much older minister, so you got to go way back with him. Come on. He said, we'll get, uh, <laughs> we get a chicken thief in the altar and two God robbers trying to pray him through. When your spirit comes again, you're going to let go of Abraham Lincoln and whoever else. I see, I don't even know who's on them dollar bills. I just know they go faster than water. (laughs) You're going to let go and let God do some things in you. See, I'm preaching to people that's been in this thing for a while. And you know what I'm talking about when you're on the mountain and you feel it. And it don't take four hours of singing the same chorus to get you jacked up. Folks, I have not been around as long as some of you, but I have been around long enough that I've been in some atmospheres that you strike a match, it's going to blow up. Do you know how dangerous that it is to strike a match in a room that has been filled with propane? Not a very good idea. Do you know the reason why that a lot of churches and a lot of services don't ever get off the ground? It's because there ain't enough fuel in the room to get a fire started. I came to church tonight. You better be thankful. Testimony time. I got off work late. And they didn't deposit my check. So barely had no time. My husband was fussing because dinner wasn't ready. Little Freddie didn't have time to do his homework. But bless God I'm here. What you need, what you need is to go back over and pick the jawbone back up and realize the same things that have brought you victory in the past. God said, I ain't done with you. If you pick it back up, if you go back to prayer, if you go back to studying my word, go back to loving me and loving the saints, God said, I'll put a fire in your church that the devil cannot snuff out. Somebody raise your hand and praise him. You see, I just believe tonight this is exactly where we find Samson in Judges chapter 15. Come on, somebody. I believe, man of God, that this is right where Samson is. You see, if we read right over what took place in the Word of God, Okay, Samson took a jawbone. He whipped a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. End of story. It would take me probably two or three days to just hit a thousand men with a jawbone. That story was much longer than just a few words. This ain't nothing. You ever watch somebody play back-to-back basketball tournaments? Their jersey, you could do like that, just ring water. Sock, socks to be soaking wet. Water pouring off their face. Water pouring off their elbows. Can I tell you the man of God? Samson was in a grueling battle with a thousand men. I don't know if he whipped that thing around a thousand times. But if you whip a, a baby bottle around a thousand times, you're going to get tired. 
you're going to start feeling it. I want you to see that man as he's done fault. He's about like an old dish rag about to be put up in the cupboard. He's gave everything he's got. Anybody here tonight feel like that? You've been trying to take up the slack of those that left you. You've been trying to take up the slack of those that walked off from you. You've been trying to take up the slack of those that act like they don't appreciate what you do. That don't recognize your sacrifice. Come on, help me preach. Samson was wore out. Come on, help me preach. I, I got some preaching to do tonight. He was totally exhausted, wiped out. I believe the minute that that man got done with the last one, he probably thought to himself, my Lord, oh, man, I don't know how much more I can take it. Ain't no more Philistine. Oh, and he took that jawbone and he looked around. Man. Man, I'm so thirsty. I'm just, I'm so thirsty. I could just have me a drink. I'm I'm so hot and I'm so tired. I I just, I need a drink. And the more he thinks about it, he's looking around. He don't see nothing. And he cries out to God. God, are you going to let me whoop a thousand men? And die of thirst. You going to let me pass in this church five years. And go out like that. You going to let me put blood, sweat and tears into this. And go out because I ain't got enough money. You're going to let us go out because my bass player quit us. Went down the church and started a bunch of rumors. Come on, somebody. You're going to let me go out like this. I'm sopping wet. I've done whipped a thousand men and I'm going to die out here of thirst. <laughs> but the Bible said that God he clave a hollow place in the jawbone of that donkey. I don't want to be too funny right here, but listen to me. You got to have a desperate man to drink water out of a donkey jaw. Why is it that God has to prune us back to almost bare limbs before we get desperate enough we won't revive all that bad? So bad that we're willing to have church and we ain't even got no music. And last month we couldn't have church unless we had a full choir. Because we weren't desperate enough. I looked up that word cleave. And it's essentially that there's a place inside of the jawbone where the water was at. That's disgusting. But somehow, this man of God whips a thousand men with a jawbone full of water. It never leaks out. He throws it to the side. And the word clave means broke. Tore. So God tore. He broke. I don't know if God caused a crack to just, just like that. And water starts dripping out. And the man of God, oh Lord, that's just what I have been looking for. <laughs> Come here, sister. Come here. Hurry. Don't fall down, though. No. Come on up here. You are newest member. Praise God. It's been good having you at our church. Oh, yes, Pastor, it's just so good to be here. 
How long you been playing the piano? She said, more oh, about six months. I can just barely peck around on it, you know, and all that. Hmm. Well, you mind playing every song for us? Pastor, are you sure about that? Because I've only been playing a couple months. But the man of God said, look, what I've been looking for for the last few weeks, and since my spirit has begun to slowly come back, I've been looking for a hollow place. I've been looking for a crack. I've been looking for some result. I've been looking for something to come to me. And here you are. <laughs> you are right here. You ain't got to be, amen, a five-gallon jug of water. You ain't got to be a five gallon bucket of water. You ain't got to be the whole city water supply. It's just enough to bring my spirit back. Get on that piano. <laughs> you been how long you been playing the drums? You've never played them. Well, I'm seeing a crack. Get over there. You're gonna learn. <laughs> You know, if we work with what God gives us, if you'll do what you're supposed to do with what God gives you, God will bless you with more. Some pastor said, some pastor said, Pre preacher, that ain't no new news. I've done trained a whole school of them that done left me and I just keep training them. Wow. Amen. But when your spirit comes again, everything is going to change. You get bad news when you walk in the church. Bad news. As soon as you walk through the door. Pastor, so and so and so and so. Last week, you'd have been like, oh, no. Oh. I, I guess I better get up and preach to him today. I better get up here and talk to him today. But this week, somebody came up and said, Pastor, Sister So and So called for church, and she said she ain't she ain't gonna be here. I got a feeling she may not be coming back either. And here you're fixing to go in and try to get your praise on. And you're praising God like this. If folks realize what you see from the platform, I've said before, if I had a video camera, some of the ugly faces people make you wonder if they were still saved. reach over and just about knock the eyeballs out of the one sitting beside them and turn around. Y'all helping me preach? But you see, when your spirit starts coming back to you, you start looking at stuff different. It used to bother you that you come in and you look around and, and last Sunday you had 65 and this week you come in you got 25 and last week you went home like this. Your wife said you need a kickstand. Maybe God's done with me. Honey, you think I should retire? Maybe they're just tired of hearing the same person. and Maybe they're just tired of... Maybe what they need, they need them a new piano player. I think I'm going to leave. Are you helping me preach? So... When you get a whole different perspective because your spirit came back to you, you walk in, you look around, 25 tonight. Well, last week we had 65. And God, I want to thank you that we don't have five tonight. That's right, it's the truth. 
Because when I start preaching, somebody told me one time I preached in the Anthony house. Used to go there every Saturday night, preach to the, amen, the battered women and the homeless in the Anthony house over uh, Plymouth area. And uh, there were nights I went in there and sister, I'd walk in, there wouldn't be nobody there. Just me and my family. We walked in the door. I looked around. Wasn't nobody there. And God called and told me to do this. And so, you see, God doesn't call you, amen, to bring about the results. God calls you to be obedient. He said, except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain and build it. God said, I didn't call you to worry about who showed up, who didn't. I called you to go. Sometimes I'd go in there, sister, and I'd look around. There wouldn't be nobody there. And I'd open up the front door. My daughter hadn't started playing the piano yet. All she could do was try to help me sing a little bit in harmony. I'd get my guitar out. I'd sound like a hillbilly from Kentucky somewhere. I'd get up there and I'd go to sing and give it everything I had. Amen. We got to worship it. And all of a sudden, the anointing would begin to start moving. Has anybody ever preached to somebody in their pajamas? I have. Some folks, you think they're in their pajamas. I'm talking about people that really on purpose are in their pajamas. People start coming in through the door. They come and sit down on the pew. Amen. And my pastor went with me one time. At the time I wasn't pastoring. My pastor told me later on. He said, son, there's something about you that I really like. He said, I ain't never seen nobody do this. He said, you preach the same if it's six or if it's 600. I said, brother, I said, I just get my focus on what God called me to do. I preached in Jamaica to almost 500. I want you to know I preached the same. You know why? Because that man of God inside of you, that oil is just as hot. That fire is still burning. And I say, God, let our spirit come again so we can raise up a new generation in 2013. How many will give me five more minutes? I didn't get but 10, so I'll. Here's what I want you to see. Huh? Uh, we're down to the, to the sausage here. The meat. You ready? You see, the Bible does not say his flesh came again. The Bible did not say that that weary, broken down, sweaty body got revived. His spirit came again. When a man's spirit comes again, his beat up, broken down body will do things he didn't think it could do. Let me give you a good word of advice. And young people, listen close to this preacher. When you ever get to the point in your life where that you lose your fight, you're in trouble. When you get to the place you lose that gumption, that fight inside, you ought to hear the signal and the siren going off. And... And, and you know why? Because you're entering into a dangerous place. Let me tell you the difference tonight between somebody that's gone through a trial and backslid and somebody that went through a similar trial and kept going. One of them lost their fight. I'm going to make it real for you, okay? Have you ever came to church and you said things like, I don't feel like going, but I'm going anyway. I don't feel like playing that piano tonight, but I'm going anyway. That one that's on their way out will be the one that says, I don't think I can make it. What's the matter with you? Well, I got a corn on the side of my big toe. 
You get off the phone, says, funny, I saw him at Walmart for two hours last night walking around. Well, is your husband coming to church? No, I don't think he's going to make it either. Is all ten of your kids coming? No, I don't think they're going to make it either. So one person's got a corn toe and all ten people stay home. I'm preaching and you ain't saying a whole lot. Some of you pulled your corn toe underneath the pew. You know I'm preaching the truth. Some of you have been around church so long, you're going, oh Lord, he is saying the truth tonight. How many times have you looked around and said, why ain't they here tonight? I ain't worried about it. I'm going on anyway. You see, we look at it like we're being punished because they didn't come. Sometimes people think they're punishing us. But let me tell you what you're really doing is you're punishing yourself. Because when the jawbone is passed, you ain't going to be there. Shake your head and say, that's right. That's right. When the jawbone is passed and the Spirit of God moves, you ain't there. You're too busy running your church down, your pastor down, and everybody else. Next month, you're going to want your teenage boy, amen, to come to church and have confidence when your pastor prays for him, so stop running him down. And you want to know why your children don't worship whenever sister so-and-so's up leading the church singing. It's because all they hear about. Oh, I'm getting me a Holy Ghost headache tonight. Praise God. So the emphasis tonight is on the Spirit. So God is concerned to resurrect and to revive your spirit because you can put a smile on these lips of clay but your spirit is dead you can hop with the best honey they do that in jazzercise or whatever that all the time that don't do nothing Ooh, I'm feeling it. That's all you got out of church. When you get your spirit to come back to you, when it returns, you will zone out those that don't worship God. You don't even see them. You don't even see them. I preached this way before. One church, well, I won't say what flavor it was, so don't ask after church. We was, we was pastoring in one place, and me and my wife, we, my wife likes to have church. If y'all didn't know, that's the best woman standing on the face of the earth as far as I'm concerned. Right here. Got it all going on. Me and my wife, we'll go to worship in God. The Spirit began to move and fall. And we've been a whole nother frame of mind. We were having church, shouting and rejoicing. And we look around and everybody's sitting there looking at us. You mean I just shouted for 45 minutes and all y'all did was watch me? I hope it was entertaining. There ain't going to be no commercial breaks in church, folks. And so if you're waiting for that, there isn't going to be none. Why don't you just get off of your hands and begin to lift them up to God until that fountain from heaven starts flowing again until God revives your spirit. You see a man that is totally exhausted, a woman that's led the choir for five weeks straight and is totally exhausted. Is this okay? I'm getting closer to 40, so I can't preach like I did two, five, three, whatever years ago. Uh, (laughs) 
Boy, I am getting old. I just forgot what I was going to say. She talks like that. That messes everything up. Listen to me now. Listen to me, folks. This man's spirit's coming back to him, right? This man has got to the place that if he if something does not change, he's going down. You can't survive if you keep going like this. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to get a little ahead of myself, and I hope this just fits right in here. You see, when I, I sat down and the Spirit of God began to speak to me about this, I mean, I looked at all different kinds of stuff. I went and looked up the synonyms for refresh. All that stuff we already knew was there. Revive and vitalize and, you know, all of that. So then I said, well, I wonder what the antonym of refresh is. You know, that's the opposite. So I turned over there and I got to looking. And it said to destroy or to ruin. Now hold that thought for just a minute. We have an epidemic in our churches all over. Every denomination just about as you can imagine. All different peoples. Where you have leadership. I'm going to preach to the leadership. So if you're in leadership, I'm preaching to you for just a few minutes. We have leadership that has this mentality. That because God has called them to do what they do. It's always give and no receive. Are you listening? How many churches? Come here, Brother Zickler and Brother Smith. Come here, my brother. Y'all just stand right over here like, I don't even, I'm not going to put you in position. Stand over there like preachers do. Stand like preachers stand. Everybody else has experienced a shower of blessing. The Holy Ghost is falling. Somebody told me one time, they said, still water runs deep. I said, still water stagnates. But we have a problem. I have told people that sing in my church. I said if the Holy Ghost gets a hold of you. I don't care if we don't have any piano playing. What good does it do us to have instrument players. That nobody ever sees them get touched. Never get the Holy Ghost blessing. Never pray. I'm preaching to somebody needs to listen real close. Because I'm preaching right down your row. So you can stand off. I've even tried to encourage people to get off an instrument and go pray. No, I'm fine. Same routine. Service after service after service. Now, pick that thought back up about ruin and destruction. You see, if the opposite of refreshing is ruin and destruction, you think that might be why the mighty have fallen? Because they're like Brother Myers when he goes on a road trip. I think it's a man thing. I made it in five hours and 18 minutes. My wife's over. Stop at the next rest stop. And I'm driving. Honey, you just, oh, I did? You passed it. Rest stop? Yeah, I did. Where's the next one, honey? I think it's about 10 miles. Oh. 
And I'm looking at my watch, and I've already calculated in my mind. I ain't stopping until I've done drove two and a half hours. And if I can put, and if I can put it off another hour, because I know I can stop and eat. We can gas up, and we can use the restroom, and we are out the door, and I can still make it in five hours and eighteen minutes. Let me tell you what's wrong with that mentality in the spirit realm. It's because you pass up rest area after rest area after rest area after rest area. And the man of God and the woman of God, they never get what they need. And you come in one morning and everybody's got their head down. And you say, where's brother so-and-so? Where's our pastor at? He resigned. He resigned. How the mighty have fallen. Because they failed to take their own advice. Listen to me for a minute. I want to say something very profound and very true. Back when I hadn't long started preaching, I met a young man, been preaching a little longer than me. He preached in a youth meeting that I preached in as well. I got acquainted with him. Someone, I'm, I would be careful with what I say here. Someone told me that was close to him that one night he preached to a packed house full of young people. And they had a blowout service. Saved sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. People are just experiencing a tidal wave of God. And that young minister told that close relative of his as he hung his head down after service, they sat down and he wasn't saying much. And this close relative looked at him and said, you all right? He just sat there. He said, what's the matter with you? He started crying. He said, if I could preach it as good as I live it, or if I could live as good as I preached it, I'd be in good shape. Listen to what I'm telling you. The man today is not preaching the Word of God in public places, but behind bars. Listen to me. If you don't let your spirit come again, it might be your last sermon. It might be your last praise service. Because the same thing that brought you victory before that can bring you victory again, the same thing that took you down before can also take you down again. You see, before you got saved, you struggled with something, okay? And then all of a sudden, you pass rest area after rest area after rest area, and you're going on along your merry way. You still come into church. You still try to praise the Lord. But you know that as well as I'm preaching this evening, that it ain't the same as it used to be. You better slow down and you better stop and realize that if you don't take these times of refreshing, when the Lord pours them out so that your spirit can come again, they might be standing up a year from now in a prayer service saying, pray for so and so. And you're so and so. Back out there doing the things you did before the Lord delivered you. Oh, say, well, come on now, Pastor. I would never. I'm glad Peter had a time of refreshing, aren't you? Because Peter said, Oh, no, Lord, I love you. I would never do that. 
I'm the drum player. I'm the, I'm the Sunday school teacher. I would never do that. But when that cock crew, all of a sudden, it came back to him. Can I ask you a very solemn question? I'm getting close to being done, so if you'll listen and pay close attention. When the cock crows for you, where are you going to be? What are you going to be doing? Who are you going to be mad with? Who are you going to be bitter against? I'm glad that even when we find ourselves like Peter and we have failed God miserably, that our spirit can come again. So did that happen for Peter? You could have asked 3,000 people and they'd have said, yes. I went to one church one time and I preached there as an evangelist. And I preached as hard as I could, gave it everything I had after service. Lord, help me tonight. I feel like I'm preaching to somebody. After service, some of the people took us out to eat. And these people began to talk like people do. And one of them said to me, so we like the way you preach. I said, well, thank you. I give God all the glory. I am nothing outside of what God does. Say, so, you know, our pastor used to preach like you. He don't preach like that no more. Sometimes he starts out good and then he, he just kind of rambles a little bit and then, you know, I was broken in my heart when I left that night because I thought if that man of God heard what they said about him, because chances are he may be one of those that passed one too many rest areas, has put up with one too many belligerent church people, has taken too much criticism about his own family, and he got so beat down, so wore down, that when he got up and he preached his guts out and they kept theirs in, that he finally got to the place where if you ain't going to do nothing more than that, then I ain't either. Am I still preaching somebody? Before you badmouth another preacher, you listen to me. Before you poor mouth another preacher that you don't know what they've been through, how they've been criticized, what kind of load they're carrying, pray for the man of God. Because his spirit can come again too. And if his spirit comes again, you're going to feel it from the pulpit to the back door and revival will begin to break out in your church. Let me, let, me, let me say this because I have a few more things I've got to say and I have got to close before I preach myself to death. I want to compliment you tonight and I want you to know that I'm proud of you. And I'm going to tell you why. In being around a lot of different churches and different people, I've seen lots of things. But it's not too often that you see people treat men and women of God like men and women of God. Give yourself a hand. Let me tell you the reason why. It's because that man that is feeding you, that man that is preaching his heart to you, he needs you to stand with him. 
that woman of God who has his back, who prays for him, who you go to when you got a problem instead of going to him. I could tell you I could not tell you how many times I've got so aggravated I'll be after church and my wife says, so-and-so came to me and told me so-and-so and so-and-so. I said, why in the world did they come? Why did they go to you with that? Why didn't they, why didn't they come to me and tell me that? Huh? Why are you going to dump everything on the woman of God? She is, she is not the man of God's trash can. The old saints would say, take your burdens to the altar and leave them there. Some folks got that song all messed up. It's more like, take your junk to the preacher's wife and leave it there. Just lay it on the preacher's wife. The only sanctuary that a man and a woman Pastor pray for me the only real sanctuary privacy I mean because we live in a fishbowl and everybody watches us swim around and if you kick your fin tail just the wrong way you live around people that expect a whole lot more than they do of themselves but that's okay it comes with the territory but what you need to understand is just what he said last night about his sister, if I'm not mistaken. Sister-in-law. You know how many people have been trampled because of saints of God that become sour and they wouldn't let their spirit come back to them? You might be sitting on that beautiful blue pew and holding it down real well. But just because you are here, it does not mean you are here. I'm going to preach this. I, 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 help me, Holy Ghost. I have never seen so many people in our church world today battling with depression as we see today. I personally have never seen a day when so many church people are on prescription depress antidepressants because of depression. Can I tell you tonight that if you go back to believing that God can remove any mountain you speak to, I believe you can get in the altar tonight and you can begin to lift your hands and begin to pray. You heard that song? Oh, I love that song. Break every chain. I hear the chains falling. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. You know why? Because you get people that can identify with that song because they got chains. We sing songs like that and we feel it. We think about the times that we laid in the bed and we felt like I don't know if I can go on. But I'm here to tell you on the authority of the Word of God that I serve a God that can break every single chain. There's a chain tonight that is called depression. And I speak to that mountain of depression and say remove in the name of Jesus tonight. Bear with me while I bring this plane down to a landing. Huh? Sometimes the things that refresh you, sometimes they feed you. You ever been so hungry that you ate something and it made your vitality come back? Huh? Isn't that what they did with the man whenever they told that Egyptian eat? Hadn't eaten in three days, hadn't drunk any water? Sometimes the things that feed you refresh you. So you go laying out of the house of God, sitting at home, watching an old rerun of Oprah, and wondering why you're not no more refreshed than you are, and you come to church and everybody else is shouting, and you wonder what they're shouting about. 
Because the breakthrough came last week and you decided to stay home for whatever reason. I love you tonight. I'm not trying to be rough. I'm trying to be as sweet as I can be. But folks, sometimes you just got to tell the truth. That's the problem with our churches today. We've got weak need preachers that don't want to preach the truth because they're so worried somebody's going to leave. If people don't want no more of God than that, they're going to leave anyway. Sometimes the things that refresh you cleanse you. Everybody says, well, you know, we want to shout. We want to jump high. We want to run five pews like you said last night. Huh? Not everybody wants to get down to the cleansing because it may require something of you. You may have to go home and change some things. You may have to stop going to some places. You may have to delete some phone numbers out of your phone. You stop sending them text messages you've been sending. I don't got to say a whole lot. You already know what I'm talking about. When your spirit comes again, you'll stop all that foolishness and you'll get back to serving God. You had somebody lay their hands on you when you was just a teenager and tell you God was going to call you to be a prophet or a preacher and you still ain't done it because you're still playing games with God. Sometimes the things that refresh you, cleanse you. And the reason why that some people ain't no more refreshed is because they don't want to be cleansed. They still want to have their cake. And eat it too. Sometimes the things that refresh you, they lift you. You ever had a spiritual lifting? You ever see a spiritual lifting on somebody? You ever gone home and say, man, sister so-and-so really got the victory this morning. Did you see her praising the Lord? Pastor's sitting back and he's going... This morning I saw people shout that I have not seen get with it in forever. I watched Sister Watson name come down and put a tithes in the offering. Thank God. Somebody said, well, yeah, that preacher just thankful. He can eat another steak down at, you know, Logan's Steakhouse. Oh, Lord. No, that man of God's happy because he knows. When your spirit comes again, you start you start doing right. And when you start doing right, you see the signs that something's changing. The same way you can tell when somebody's getting spiritually sick, it's the same way you can tell somebody is beginning to regain their spirit. Ask the Lord to help that preacher shut up. Hallelujah. Sometimes the things that refresh you restore you. I want this to sink down because whenever I, whenever the Lord dropped this in my spirit, I almost jumped up out of my seat to shout. You see, we done just about shouted out. So if you shout now, you're going to really shout. But sometimes the things that refresh you restore you. Job was not God's only child. What God did for Job, that was Job. That, and this is me. And The next time you feel like a stepchild and nobody don't want, lonely, broke down, having all sorts of problems, hear me. You remind yourself, Job was not God's only child. If you are a blood-bought child of the Most High God, You ought to stand up to your feet and say, I declare that I am going into the enemy's camp and I am taking back that that God has restored to me. Lift your hands across the house tonight. (laughs) 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I got to say these three things, and I'm going to ask somebody to come and play something, and I'm going to ask you tonight to get ready. Because I didn't just preach my heart so we could go eat a hamburger and go home. I just preach my heart because I really do believe within myself that tonight that somebody is going to have their spirit return to them. Three things. God restores to us. Listen. God restores to us. He restores in us. And He restores through us. When He restores to us, He gives us our reign in due season. When He restores in us, He revives that anointing. He revives your vision and your passion. When He restores through us, the gifts of the Spirit that have been idle in your life. Hmm? He restores through us. So the refreshing comes to us. The refreshing gets in us. And the refreshing, refreshing comes through us. And you're wondering, how in the world is God ever going to use me? Let me tell you this. I'll tell my son this. If God's ever going to use you to refresh and bless somebody else, yes. you yes. must first be refreshed you, yourself. Yes. Have we got anybody tonight? Maybe you're not where you need to be. Why don't you listen closely? And maybe you're like that prodigal that needs to return back to the palace. You really aren't where you used to be. You know it. You feel the change. You know where you used to be. You know how God used to use you. You remember that man took a jawbone and drank out of a jawbone. That's how desperate he was. I want to ask you this, this evening how desperate you are. You say tonight, I don't care who's looking at me. Some preachers will say, bow your heads and close your eyes. Nobody has to see you. That's the problem sometimes. You overcome that pride. And you take the first step down the aisle. I want everyone that will that says, I want to be refreshed tonight. I want you to just begin to make a line right down through the center of this aisle. I wonder how this is going to give you an opportunity to prove if you'll drink from the jawbone. Hallelujah. I won't beg you tonight, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to make a line right there. I, if I can tonight, there are some of you that know because you go to church with them, people around you. I want to... Praying women. People that pray people through. I want you to come up here tonight. Come on. If you have to volunteer somebody, get them. I want you to come right. That, that was me, uh, Pastor. That probably was me that broke in. What I...